four thousand miles apart. On the phone, and it's one o'clock in the morning. It's one o'clock in the morning. It's one o'clock in the morning, and, one in the morning and you're calling. I'm, I'm on the phone. Yeah. No, and it's three o'clock in the morning for you, and I'm like Kevin. I'm on at West Coast time. You're still going. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Todd Davis, and I am the director of the Art Museum of West Virginia University. And I want to welcome everybody who is, who is here in person, as well as everybody out there in the world who is watching virtually. We're still getting used to how to do hybrid programs, so I do have a few housekeeping notes. If you are out there in the world watching us, uh, we do have live captioning available. There's a button for that that you should go click and access live captioning. Also, at the end of the program, we will be able to take questions from out there in the world, uh, and we'll facilitate that uh, for you. Also, at the end of the program, for folks who have questions here in the audience, I will repeat them back into the microphone for our folks out there. That's the housekeeping. So, it's my distinct honor to introduce our guests for this program, which is held in conjunction with the exhibition Rauschenberg in China. The Lotus is currently on view in the Art Museum's upper gallery. December 12th. Robert Rauschenberg was a groundbreaking and influential American artist who worked in diverse mediums over a six decade career, including painting, sculpture, photography, performance, and painting. This exhibition specifically highlights Rauschenberg's extended artistic interest in China, from photographs made during his first trip there in 1982 to the final large scale graphic works he completed shortly before his death, titled The Lotus Scenes. With us here on stage in Block Hall, the Kennedy Creative Arts Center are Florence Stone and Kevin Mara, who both traveled to Morgantown for this evening's program and speak with students and museum persons during the day long. Kevin joins us from Fort Myers, Florida. Kevin worked as Robert Rauschenberg's studio assistant at Kiva Island in Florida for more than 15 years, up until the artist's death in 2008. He has graciously loaned Rauschenberg's entire suite of Lotus series prints from his personal collection for this exhibition. Thank you, Kevin. Florence Stone is an independent art curator, writer, and entrepreneur based in Los Angeles. She has served as the vice president of Portland Film since 1995, playing an instrumental role in the making of projects such as the original Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, We Shall Overcome, and Worlds Apart. Florence is currently writing and developing a musical with the renowned art and songwriter Tony Haynes. In 2017, she co curated an exhibition in Denmark featuring the Lotus series called Window to China, which was the first iteration of the exhibition that's now on view at the Art Museum. Thank you, Florence. I must acknowledge the great friendship between Florence Tone and Museum Advisory Council member, Lori Erickson, which is how we have come to be so fortunate to bring this exhibition to WVU. Thank you, Lori. And we are very grateful for the continued generous support of sponsors Harvey and Jennifer Payton, who made both the exhibition and this event possible. Thank you both. So with that, I turn the floor over to Florence and Kevin to share insights into Rauschenberg's life and studio practice, and we'll return to the spot in about 45 minutes to help facilitate questions. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here tonight, and I thank you, President Gee and Lori Erickson, Todd, Bob, Heather, and the rest of the staff, and, and everyone that's helped make this uh, such an tremendous and incredible experience tonight. It was, it was an, so exciting to see the works on the wall, huh? Absolutely, Kevin? yeah, it's a beautiful museum and thank you to everyone that put this together. It's greatly appreciated. I just like to see it up and running and, and, uh, and have people in the audience that actually will be able to see it in person too as well, so. And Thank especially you. would like to say that those of you that are um, not here tonight, please, if when you get the opportunity, please come in and, and see the exhibit. It's, it's spectacular. And there's also an incredible virtual show that is available. And so um, without further ado, it is my honor to sit here with my good friend, Kevin. And for Kevin and I, this is, this is a, a very incredible experience because we've known each other for years and we've been having these conversations and I thought my goodness we have to bring this out into the world because you know you have such an incredible knowledge of working with Bob all these years and I you know and we were talking about this two minutes before we even got into the car where you came into Bob's career 
<laughs> he already had 40 years under his belt before I showed up. So <laughs> he had quite the life. And, uh, you know, so it, he did had done so many things and to be a part for many years myself around it. I knew him actually before I started working with him and had done some things. But to finally get to a point being there every day was just the best part was, uh, was Bob, you know, when what's going on today. And uh, we would go in and sometimes you think you'd have one project and Bob would have an idea. Well, you said you had a thought and because uh, he had an idea about ideas. Um, but and we would just go over. He'd say, I want to talk to everybody. And what about this? And it's always about possibilities. And and so that was the, the fun part of each day something new could happen that could be just fantastic. Yeah, because we're talking about a, a career that you know spanned over decades. And when you came into the process, it was when he was doing the installation in, at the Guggenheim, correct? That was when you... That was, I, I had worked with him a few years up to that point, but that was one of the, well, that was one of the biggest shows anybody has ever had, uh, his retrospective in 97. That took the entire Guggenheim, also, at that time, they had uh, a satellite down in, in, in downtown, and, and uh, they had to rent a third place space for the quarter mile. It was just an enormous exhibition. It was uh, fantastic. That also traveled on to other locations and ended up in, in uh, the Guggenheim and Bill Bow, the first show that they had there. Then he didn't even start out. He didn't even know what an an artist was when he started. Well, he did, but when he um, when he joined the Navy to get away to leave Port Arthur during the end of the war, uh, the last year of the war, uh, he had a day where he was on leave, and he had made a point, and he saw Blue Boy for the first time. He said that seeing something he had seen in a book. But seeing it in front of him, uh, it made art real. That this actually, you know, this is real, and it it, it kind of gave him something to think about what he wanted to do. And, and now he was away from home, and and you know he thought about that moment. It's and because he went, you know, when when you were working with him, explain a little bit like about Bob's curiosity. Because I think when I think, you know, talk about the creative process and his curiosity. Well, Bob is curious about everything. I mean, he could walk down the street and uh, one day I was walking with him, for example, and uh, I'm talking to him and all of a sudden he, he, we were out photographing and all of a sudden I look over and he's not beside me. He's behind me and he's actually looking down at the ground because in these old brick there were some beautiful green leaf that green each step was growing and the way the sun was hitting it and he's got his camera and he's there photographing it and he would walk by things that, and just stop that most people just walk by and never stop daily things but that's his early work so I, I, of course i wasn't around there but it's just so wonderful and he always continued to love for everyday objects and just worked with, he often said, you've got to let the materials let you know what to do next. And that's what I always found fascinating, his love of just finding something and uh, the beauty of something simple as what we step on. But he used it in a painting, that, that little bit of image and worked it into that. And it was just what you stepped on. I walked past and didn't realize he had stopped. Because he called accidents free drawing. <laughs> yes, he did. Uh, there were a lot of things. He, you know, it, it, he didn't have a plan. Um, you know, he didn't want to have an idea like this is exactly what I'm going to do. That was not because he said ideas are too limiting. And when he had an idea and he started to work with that idea, he said, I usually end up disappointing myself with my idea because I didn't let it go. And, and so he liked to work in, in that way. He would start 
And then sometimes, you know, especially when, when the years I was with him, when he was working with different imagery, that one image he would put down and then all of a sudden he would say, wow, that had a lot more juice and power than I thought it was going to have. And now what am I going to do? And uh, so sometimes something that he started with ended up becoming, um, and it might end up by the time the painting was done, not the primary. He worked around it. He, it, he didn't, he never like somebody writes something and crumples it up and starts over. He didn't do that with his work. He worked as so he's look what best I made today. Let's go home and, uh, or, you know, uh, take me, let's go back and, and talk about it. And I'll, I'll, I'll start, I'll deal with this in the morning, you know, and then you go another direction. And, uh, but he always pushed forward. That was the whole point. Uh, he, he just worked every day when, when he wasn't working, he was thinking about working. And that's why sometimes, you know, one day it's Christmas. I get a phone call. Bob says, oh, on your way in, could you stop by on the island? Because we had one main supermarket that had been there for 50 years. Can you stop by and get some things? I thought, you know, we, we'll have this later. And I said, Bob, it's Christmas. And by the way, you're going to be at, at a family house, my family's house at two o'clock. So, uh, okay. Oh, I thought, I forgot about that. I thought we were going to work today. So, you know. <laughs> But it wasn't work. It was actually, uh, you know, that's what he did. He said, I, I do what I do because I can, and that's what I want to do. So, And we, we laugh about this because when you're talking about the process, we always say that there's, there's the C word. And, and they and Heather actually referred to the, she used the C word. And well, I know we, we have people that are adults here, but... I'm going to use the C word, composition. And I mean, there was things, you know, people always say, look at the composition, but it was one of the things that, that he, he didn't want to compose. And he worked and it, and it developed uh, because that's just the way he was. He, he, he's like, I don't want that there. I want this there. And it developed. And we always did joke that that was the C word because you know, critics have to make a living too. So they write things sometimes and, uh, you know, there's, um, and, you know, they've used the, the word. Um, and, uh, but he believed that the painting has to stand on its own, uh, regardless of composition or color uh, or et cetera. Um, and, and it's part of, I'm paraphrasing a quote of his, but um, it has to become a fact or kind of a inevitability. That's kind of the way he worded it a long time ago, but, and so it took on its own life and became, became something without a, a preconceived plan. You know, uh, he, he didn't create art to match the couch or the drapes so so to speak. <laughs> but you also told me that he said that you weren't creating, you were mimicking. Well, if, well, that was part of with his ideas. If he was still doing, he would get bored with his own, I mean, his own, there, at a certain point, he, he wanted to look for another challenge. And that's why if you look at his career for the six decades from where he started to where he ended, I mean, there was always movements and that went in so many directions and incorporated fabrics or, you know, sculptures or pretty much anything he could get his hands on. If at the time it, it, it felt good and, and, and it would lead to an area that if he went to a certain point, <clears throat> he, he's he, sometimes one time I heard him say, I'm beginning to feel too comfortable with this. It's just becoming a little too comfortable. And so you could see the wheels turning. He he wanted to do something else and and a new challenge because he just like going forward. He he get tired of himself sometimes. But that, that was what I laughed about though, because as a mother of children that are you know from these young you know these kids, 
and they're always talking about pain and pain to create. And he debunked that idea of, of creating from inner pain. Oh, no, it was, his, <laughs> it was his joy. He said, you know, painting was actually the best way to get along with myself. You know, it's the best way I can. It's how I, it's what I know. And, and uh, I remember when we, when he had the retrospective at, at the Guggenheim, they were like four days, the first days, you know, the, the biggest donors to everything else. And then the next day was, and then finally the day came where the, the students and people with passes, they you know, and the, and, and the kids were there and he did, he, you know, he didn't have the tux that wasn't, he went. And that was probably the most fun he had that night because he was able to walk around. And of course people knew who he was, but there were some people <laughs> that they didn't realize that the guy walking past him or standing there overhearing their conversation was actually Robert Rushmore. Didn't the one lady say that he was dead? <laughs> well, well, funny thing is I'm walking with him and, and, and there was a group of people and somebody was uh, talking about him. And then somebody else said, how long has it been? How long has he been dead now? <laughs> has it been how long? And he and I looked at him and he grabbed me, literally grabbed me by the arm, like, don't say a word. This is great. I want to, <laughs> I want to hear some more. <laughs> I, I want to hear some more. We stood there a few minutes and it was, it was, that's the way he was, uh, you know, because he, um, he had a great sense of humor. I mean, that, that's what so many things that was wonderful and part of the thing uh, because he could relate to anybody. He could be in a room with fishermen, farm, farmers, anybody. He'd walk into the room, but he had this uncanny personality that whatever he room, room he was, even if it was in the, at the White House or you know, front and center in the Guggenheim with people from all over the world that came there, he could relate to her, but he wanted to know about you. He kept an eye on everything. He was a fantastic observer, and he, um, he, he, he enjoyed what people had to offer, and, that's, and he drew from that. The same way when he went, uh, uh, you know, photographing or something, because, I, you know, it was seeing something, and he drew, from, he drew from everything, even the television. Yeah, that's what I, yeah, I laughed. He said the television was always on, and it was the third window. It was. It was an extra window. And uh, television was on sometimes 24-7, you know. And, uh, but it was an extra window to see what's going on. Of course, he loved his soaps. And uh, so he mainly had CBS because he's a big, big, young and a restless fan as well. And we watched Oprah every day. And, it, but it was on in the background. It wasn't, he wasn't staring at it. It was, it was part of the room along with the other people in the room. It was an added person, an added idea. And that there were even things when, when we were watching Oprah, there'd be something we hadn't heard about yet or, and Bob would be interested and he'd want to find out more. And the next thing you know, he's doing something to, for, for that cause or that charity, or what can we do about that? And, and that changed what we were doing for the day. And it, it became uh, a direction for the art, the way that it, actually that's, that's so incredibly fluid and you know because his generosity i don't think people realized oh my goodness oh my oh yeah well you know he didn't come he, he had very humble beginning and but he never he never forgot being just every, incredibly <laughs> humble and tell a little bit about his mom but when you told me about his mom god oh god beautiful story yeah yeah I, I i just he always got a kick out of his mom because you know Bob was always Bob and his, he loved his mom and everything else as we, as we all do and everything. But uh, um, sometimes, you know, because Bob was gone and he was traveling the world and, and I think there were, he said, I don't sure his mom's name was Dora and, and, uh, but she always understood what, where he's at because he was, he was like the wind and he was traveling. But what about when the storm was coming and she, <laughs> well, <laughs> She she was living in, in lived in Lafayette, Louisiana, and uh, there was a hurricane coming, and so it looked like it was coming their direction. So 
they decided to board up the windows and door had a lot of things that were plywood in the garage and around that were actually Rauschenberg's, early Rauschenberg's. So when Bob was checking up on her and she said, well, we've this nice young man and we've got it all boarded up and everything. And we, it, what'd you board it up with? Will we use the paintings? <laughs> and uh, Bob thought for a second, well, they're hers, but he said, he said, he said, well, did you at least turn them facing in? And she said, oh gosh, yes, Milton. You don't think we want the neighbors to see what you do. So he always got a kick out of it though, because, it, because he, he always wanted to, his name was Milton. He chose to become Bob when he was traveling and he, you know, of course, then everybody turned it into Robert, but he, you know, he said the first, per, first person I tell my name is Bob. He said, it was hindrance enough having a name as long as Rauschenberg to begin with and not alone. Milton. He always said Milton. Milton, because that I guess when he was in trouble, he heard Milton. But uh, I can't believe he got in trouble a lot when he was young. But um, but he just wanted to be Bob, and he wasn't Rauschberg. And he would would go into places, you know, like I said. It, it, for example, sometimes after photographing, we'd stop at this one place where you could actually have a cigarette and 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 have a cocktail and there would be people in there and nobody knew who he was but at the end of the day same way we'd be talking and everything and they'd be see you bob nobody had an idea and somebody did say so oh, I, i'm a painter well they they just uh, maybe he's a house painter because he'd wear he had paint spatters on him which actually you know about the young and the restless uh, he was friends with the producers and uh there was something, and he always watched the show every day, and they knew that. But at one point, they, uh, they said, wouldn't it be great to have you as a cameo to come on? And he said, doing what? And he, they said, oh, we'll make you a house painter. And he thought that was hysterical. Because actually, he and Jasper Johns painted houses in the Hamptons when they were young in order to, to be at the Hamptons. So, um, and store, storefronts. They did storefronts the, and Tiffany designed storefronts. They did, did storefronts. They did, they did so many things that people, in fact, one lady said, I think you painted my house 40 years ago, 40, 50 <laughs> years ago. Do you think that's worth anything? And Bob said, if you haven't painted your house in 40 years, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, would you please share with us a little bit of about the, Lo the actual Lotus series? Yeah, the Lotus series that's here, it, it actually came about, uh, it's kind of a re revisiting because things have changed in China and about towards the end of 2006, early 2007, Bob was approached because the Beijing Olympics were coming up in 2008 and uh, summer, the Summer Olympics. And Bob was approached about, what do you think about doing a series and doing some th things and, and uh, revisiting China because it's sure changed since 1982 and uh, he decided to do that so we went through and started just open up some of the old books of, of the thousands and thousands of photographs that he'd taken in his life oh my gosh that's one thing his his photographs are so underappreciated because oh my gosh they're fantastic uh just uh, thousands of, of just unbelievable photo images but um so that came about, and, and unfortunately, uh, he passed right before um, the show in the, the Olympics a, a couple months. So, and before. this series has special significance for you because it was a gift. It, yes, it was. I was very fortunate. But uh, you know, it is. Re it, it, Bob was one of those that, when it was his birthday, you might get get a gift or something, and things like you know. First time I ever, because uh, I had known Bob for some years, but I wasn't working with him, but it was his birthday. And I stopped by to say hello and see how he was doing and wish him a happy birthday. Nobody was around. Bob had his new house, this very stark area that focused, the focus was the art, not furniture. 
there were bar stools though, so everybody could get comfortable. But and he had a ping pong table and liked to play ping pong. And it was good when people come over and late night they would do that. But he had all these images and things and his artworks on the on the ping pong table. And he said, Why don't you go over there and take a look at those and see what you think? Mm-hmm. And I walked over and I was like, wow, these look great. And uh and I said, well, have you been busy? He said, well, I knew my birthday was coming up. And I said, well, yeah. I said, well, I've got to run, but I just wanted to come by and, and tell you happy birthday. And he said, well, we'll pick one out. And I was like, pick one out? What do you mean? And he said, pick one out. I'm giving these away to celebrate my birthday. And he did. And he he didn't say that, but... You ever popped in the house and and and, and, uh, and you know they they they, they were got a rouse for it. It was like oh my gosh, but that's the way he is because he loved people around. If you knocked on Bob's door, if we we'd be standing in there in the kitchen in his house and we hear a knock, it was like oh my god, who is that? Because if you were knew him and were friends with him. You never knocked. In fact, you get scolded if you. Why are you knocking? You scared the heck out of me. And uh, because he, he was just that open, and he enjoyed people, because that it, he he interacted, and he was, and, and that always worked with his art. But this, when when you're talking about when people knocked on the door, you're talking about when he was at Captiva. Yes. So when he moved to Captiva, and that he actually found he moved to Captiva with a monkey. He had a monkey with him. Well, he didn't move with the monkey, but he found Captiva with the monkey. He had he had a traveling companion. He had gone to and, and and this is paraphrasing some of the story, but he decided that he wanted to get out of New York and there was something else because things had changed and you know, and of course he had fame and that, but he he was getting caught up on other things and Bob liked to work and he said it was getting hard, harder and harder to work. And so he went to a fortune teller, a fortune teller down there and in, in New York and said, uh, and they, she said, you need to be around water, surround yourself around water. And so he decided to take a trip, but he had a little monkey. <laughs> I never met the monkey, but uh, he had a monkey with him. And, 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 and he, he also uh, had traveled. He had looked at, at islands, but he had to take a ferry to get, to Sanibel Captiva, they hadn't built the causeway yet, but he was traveling down and, uh, but he saw uh, a, a turtle in the road, which was, he had his turtle for 50 years plus. Turtle and outlived him. Rocky. And, uh, and, um, and he went to move the turtle out of the, out of what well, wasn't even a road. It was a path. And he saw these butterflies and the color. And he's like, I think I found my place. And, he, had, he went to work to, he wanted to buy buy something there. And every time he said, I just about had the money to, to get it, uh, it was already sold. And then finally, the the last place that he lived for a year since, uh, you know, like 1970 or so, um, he bought that originally, the main chunk sight unseen, because he said, I'm not letting another piece go. <laughs> you know, and not I. Because I, I, I find that funny, as a, you know, with all the parents that are that have student, you know, that students, and if their son or daughter comes home and said they spoke to a fortune teller, and they want to <laughs> take their pet monkey in a car and drive and find a destination, they might be the next Rauschenberg. <laughs> <It's> possible. <laughs> but speaking of Rocky, um, you know that to me. I, you know, before um, a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine said to me, what was I working on next? And I said that I was coming to West Virginia and I was going to do a show on China. And, the, you know, they tried to uh, like, OK, a show on China. OK. And and I said that I felt it, that the message that Rostenberg of the original trip and why he went to China and why he went to the Soviet Union and Cuba and Venezuela with, it was such an important message. And it was such an important as like, what can art do? Yeah. And, and you know, because art, it, it's, 
it is in such an important part of our curriculum and these programs are being cut left and right and and you know children that are that are interested in or children or students that are interested in pursuing art that you know that is why i was fascinated by rocky and what bob was doing and the globalization of art well you know that came about bob was asked uh, to do a world tour of somebody from a gallery that had a gallery and some people from in california and he was like a world tour but finally uh, he 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 was approached he did a, a project a paper a, a paper project with gemini out in los angeles and about doing traveling and, and doing additional working in China was the first stop to do that. So Rocky was- Came later, yeah. Came later, yeah, it did, yeah. but during during that time when they were working in the, the, the paper mill was like the oldest in the world, it's, it's like 1500 years old. It, it's the origins of the paper mill. And during that time, because of restrictions and and all the suspicions of what what what's he doing here, you know, it completely, he actually couldn't work, go into the paper mill, so they set up and they had a, a, a an area and place where they worked and they worked tirelessly and they would actually send templates of the paper to the mill and then they make the mill but not go in, you know, and actually work in in there because of the their own secrecies and just and that but um there was a gentleman that was one of the one of the cooks that was there and he and bob became friends and one day he invited him into the kitchen to, to share recipes and and dumplings and uh and so while they were doing this and cooking bob said um so where's your so where's your family? You married? He said. He said yes. He said, where's your where's your family? And he said twenty five miles away. And he said, well, how often do you see them? He said twenty five years ago. And uh, and I heard a story from Donald Saff, who traveled with him. He's a brilliant man, and actually started Graphic Studios, where was who was so kind from University of South Florida to lend the photographs from that from that those days, which thank you, by the way, is very nice. But um, it just hit Bob so so much. And 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 the gentleman said, nobody really com comes, nobody's come here. And then you see us, you need to go and do, because Bob kind of explained what they were, you know, doing and all that. You need to go show the world that, and, that there are things that, because we can't, we're here, but Yes, because he wanted to reach people in places that that don't, you know, that they're not on the circuit. Like he, it was so important to him. Like you know, the the thing that I loved about when I've heard all these stories and read about him that he did, he loved being at the Guggenheim, but he also loved having a small show in like Edis at the oh, yeah. community college in Edison, and and you know he had such a, a incredible humility. And he was the, yet at, even at his he was famous and very you know he's well it, from but the he 50s. he wasn't famous to himself I mean he knew that it, it, he did have power that he could do things because he saw himself in other young artists and 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 or anybody or if someone needed a hand or anything he just he he never he did not see himself as you know Robert Rauschenberg he was Bob. He didn't as Robert Rauschenberg, superstar. He was just Bob, and he. But he did see that you know that committed. art was a, a transmitter of information. It was. He, it, he, well, Bob's greatest art that he ever was was his himself, and so he realized that he could share things and and create things to give other others hope to do what they wanted to, and and uh, which was it's all he wanted was that art changed can change lives and he knew that it, it, even if it's in the smallest way so, as somebody that may come to the show now that sees that and it that he'd learn a little bit more and they learn about what's what art can do they could be the next whoever that changes the world in some way it's 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 just breaking down barriers and, and yeah because that's what they, they said that the that the show in 1985 that was in China and over the course of three weeks more than 300,000 
Chinese people saw his show. He was the first American to do a solo show con of contemporary art. And, and, you know, and any of us that have even just an, all these contemporary uh, Chinese artists and dissidents, and they all say that that was like the demarcation. There actually is in a post and pre Rauschenberg in Chinese art, there's, there's a term. Yes, a lot of people consider that because of the freedom that they saw this. And it, it happened with Bob and, and what he did, which also, because it got started there, but it continued to grow was he would go into a country and take photographs and then he'd do his thing and then come back, return with that kind of a, like an outsider seeing something that you don't always see yourself sometimes as others. And then he would work with, you know, the artisans in that as well. And, 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 and collaboration was key to him. And, and that's what he loved to do. And that's why there was, you know, but he used his own money. He find he, this was self finance. Oh yeah. Because uh, in, in his mind, if he, uh, if, if he took government money or government grants or anything else like that, and now governments are involved. And this wasn't this wasn't a political mission or anything like that. No, this was people meeting people, working together. And um, exactly. And, people, and that's that exactly, would, exactly. And so it almost broke him. And fortunately, he, you know, he had some other artwork of, from other people that were good friends and, as well. And, and he sold his personal collection and it almost bankrupted him. And uh, but when Bob did something, he didn't do it for show. He put his heart, he put his money where his mouth was. He did it because he really truly believed in it. He, he was, people say, oh, he's so, I, I remember a gentleman, I overheard him and I had to kick somebody under the table. Please don't tell him I work for, for Bob. He was talking about Rauschenberg and he's going, oh, he does all this and does all that and, you know, just for show. And he's all these things. And I was like, and they're like, aren't you going to say anything? I said, no. And then finally he was talking to me, he says, so what do you do? And I said, I work for Bob Rauschenberg. But I didn't, I wanted, you know, just like with Bob, you want to hear the truth, you, 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 you stay quiet, you got to listen. But um, he didn't do anything for, for, he did do it for, he, if it was a show, it was for a show that was going to be for a result for good and change, you know, change. Actually, he had a foundation called Change Inc. that if you were an artist and you couldn't pay your rent, you could, he, he kept and raised money for his own and you could submit your reasoning if you needed or you had a doctor bill. He actually has, and that's still part of his foundation. And uh, that, you know, that's who does that. But, but he was also but, yeah. a little bit of a renegade because he was hanging out with Fidel Castro, inviting him. He, with, he, was, he was so, and, you know, he started, didn't he also work with Gorbachev on a, one of yes. the... Um, Found well, he had. wasn't going there to, you know, like you, it's the same way. It just ended up that way. And there was, a, a, but because of the art and all that, he did get to sit there. And of course, they, their, their political views and that didn't even. He wasn't even political. He, no, he wasn't. No, but they actually uh, struck up an odd because Fidel thought Bob was, you know, curious. Who is this man? coming and spending his own money to do these things and all that. So there was a curiosity, but the, there was a curiosity from Bob because that's who he was. And, uh, and they uh, had a surprising friendship uh, uh, that, in fact, Bob said that um, you know, maybe things will change one day. You can come to my island, meaning uh, Captiva. And, uh, and Fidel said, well, you know, I, we're having so much fun. I could keep you on my island, but. <laughs> Bob said, no, I'm going to mine. We'll talk later. But uh, no, I mean, but he was that personable. But the whole thing was just his curiosity and his warmth was authentic. And therefore, here he, he made Castro curious. And just, you know, there's something about authenticity that uh, you can't buy or replace. And, and, and Bob was Bob. And that's and he's been gone now for 13 years. 13 years. How do you think he would have managed with the lockdown and the pandemic? Oh, boy. Um, Bob liked people. And uh, we, we, we all probably would have uh, had to quarantine uh, at the studio because <laughs> uh, how are we going to get the work done if we if we didn't? But uh, 
been very tough for him because uh, people was a lifeblood, you know, I, and Bob is one of those people that uh, when you worked for him, you weren't, you were his, he, his friend as well. Bob treated you were never, you know, just an employee. He valued everyone. I call it Bob's menagerie. He was a great collector of people. He saw things in people that maybe you didn't see in yourself. I mean, I know that happened for me personally. Um, I had, that, that was not an option to be ending up where I am <laughs> to, to, to do that. But, um, but he saw things and, and he had to, he had, he had to trust you. That was one of the things he trusted you and trusted. And it was a collaboration. People did this, that lines crossed and, and it was, um, it was energy and we're going to work. And we were, it, it was part of, you know, just, uh, teamwork with everything. Teamwork with everything. So you walk us, like walk us through a day because you were, you'd work almost like five days a week. You'd go in every, every, every day. Um, five that's wow that'd been nice that <laughs> we that we uh that wasn't work I, uh, sometimes we work seven, seven days a week or whatever we and we had what we were doing on because a lot of things we had shows that were coming up and and so but then some days um bob had had a dream or was wondering curiosity about something and uh and uh, he would talk to, you know, or, or some material, and he would talk to Lawrence Wojtek, who did a lot of the research and worked with Bob for over 30 years. And, and, uh, and Lawrence was fabulous because of his curiosity and interest in materials and, and things. And Bob always wanted to know what's, what's going on now, what's, what's new, what's new. And once again, if there was a new material, that might change the direction because like Bob, Bob let the materials and when we're, we're talking about the materials, I, for those of you unfamiliar with these works, we're talking about a scope that is, I mean, incredible. Your studio was like the size of a football, half a football. It was I very mean, large. We had fabric room. We had, there was a little bit of everything, silk screens. Uh, we had um, most wonderful tools and everything to make things. We did our own castings, things that, because it was custom, you just don't, call up somebody in town and say, Hey, can you, can you do this? And, uh, because sometimes nobody had done it before. And, uh, so it was always an adventure, which was fun. The process was fun. And, and, um, I myself never went to art school, but I feel say, well, where did you go to school? And I went to the school of Rauschenberg because it's worked with wonderful people who did, you know, uh, Rhode Island school of design, RISD grads and, uh, Brown University and, and, and other people, you know, places and, and, you know, it didn't matter what degree you had, but if you, you can't, if you filled a part of the puzzle, Bob, but, but, you University. know, but um, the incredible installations that you would do for the, of the bicycles or the labyrinth in Italy, like there was so many different things that you guys worked on that were just, it wasn't just painting. It wasn't just, there was no, installations. No, it wasn't, was, you know, just photograph. I, we're talking like, cars it, it was, there was i mean there was painting a, car you know i just well we there, there, there was a, a sculpture that that bob was going to do and it's in stuttgart now and but it and and his idea was with bicycles and because he loved bicycles and that too and 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 but it was going to be in the middle of a fountain and of course it, it wouldn't hold up so basically he loved these old bikes but uh through the research and that and lawrence did and 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 uh, everything, that's when we really start doing a lot of casting, just dis disassembled. And Lawrence taught everybody, even we make cast and we cast on big scales and, uh, uh, and, and, and put it all back together. At the end of the day, it looked like the original old bikes. And now they are in the fountain and, and doing what they're supposed to do and to raise curiosity and, and people stop and look at it. It's beautiful. You know, so you had to like, yeah, it was a long a, process. Putting, yeah. Putting like a, a sculpture in a fountain. And then, cause you also had like weather concerns, like in, when you talk oh, yeah. about in Italy. And that's, you know, and, 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 and uh, there, there, there's a lot of people that, and, and of course, you know, uh, it was team efforts wherever those things were going. Oh, absolutely. But and, I'm saying like, you would, you would, you were going to do the installation in Italy and share that, that he was working. Well, I, I, I didn't actually do yeah, the installation, yeah, yeah, right. and, but, but 
we were always a part of what the installations would be. And so that some, some would go over, I went on some installations, not all, but, um, uh, but it was, it was quite a procedure. But it snowed process. <laughs> oh, it snowed there. The museum, it, it, the labyrinth was outside. It's, it's silk screens on plexiglass and, and, and it was set up out in the gardens, but and they had one of the most, in, it's in, a, what's in a Ferrara, Italy. And they had this snowstorm that just came out, just like the most they'd had in a hundred years. And it, it, they were so nervous. It, it was so beautiful, but they were nervous because of the storm that was coming through. And of course, Bob said, I couldn't have planned it better myself because this is absolutely beautiful. And he wanted people to play in the snow and walk through his art. It was a curator's nightmare. I'm yeah, sure. but you yeah. said this. Yeah, you said that because Todd said, oh, it's a dark and they were considering, which we're grateful that the light and you said that when you were up in New England and you were doing an installation. Oh, yeah. We, we, <laughs> well, when we did the uh, quarter mile at uh, uh, Mass Mocha and this is going to be their first show in the beginning, but um, you could in the room was so large to held it, but they had windows there and, and it, they had not covered them yet. And you could see part of the Berkshires in the background through and the light was coming in. And when Bob walked to see, they said, don't worry, Bob, we're going, because some of the items have fabric, we're going to take care of that. We're going to cover the windows. And so the sun will hit them. And he said, why? That looks fantastic. And so um, uh, he said, I didn't make this art to sit in a basement. I want people to see it. And that's, 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 you know, uh, I actually had the Lotus Aries in my, you know, in, in, in the crates in, in, at home and to have a space to see it. I want it shown. And, and it, this is a great opportunity. And thank you to, to everyone that puts this together because it's, it's supposed to be seen in conversations like this that can change art for and continue to make art for young students and everyone else down the road. So. Yes. I think. Yes. Thank did, you. Did you have some it's time? We uh, maybe take some questions. I would offer that to folks here in the room as well as folks out online if there are any questions. Uh, I also feel like that forty-five minutes just flew by, and that we could probably watch you two talk for hours because this is riveting conversation about uh, insight into Rauschenberg's life. I see Heather has stood up, and so why don't you? Why don't we do one from the from the ether? Oh, I was just standing here to be prepared and oh, to, remi sorry, to sorry. I'm reminding folks that are out in the ether to use the Q&A rather than the chat function. And I will read them back into the microphone here. So I'm going to be checking. Oh, and now we have one. Great. All right. So one of our art history students wants to know, uh, what is your favorite work by Robert Rauschenberg? Robert Rauschenberg. <laughs> <laughs> To, to narrow that down would be, it's, it's impossible. It, it, uh, my favorite works are just, were, were things, um, were the, well, probably the ones I was around and witnessing at the time because the process and just the joy. But I've been surprised. I, I still, sometimes I'll see you Rauschenberg for the first time in person and I'm going, wow. I, the cardboards, first time I saw them in person, made me cry. We were at the, at, at the Guggenheim and I, first time in New York, took the wrong train, took the express. By the time I got there, Bob's already gone. But there, there they are, but how pristine and beautiful lit on the wall. And there was a whole whole crew that came here all the way from, from Tokyo. And here were the cardboard boxes. And I went, it just made me realize, I was like, wow, how pristine. And, and this is really, he made art out of this. And, and I realized this isn't just Bob that I get in the refrigerator and go to work for that um, is Rauschenberg. But uh, I think that probably moved me the most. The cardboard. The cardboards. Yes. And now, so we're, you're being asked to pick and choose a good Can't thing out it. there in the, in the, because the next question is which of his works did you, do you find to be the most socially influential? So so going from your favorite to the most influential. Well, there's a, there's a piece that worked on for several years and, and the last piece is, became uh, what's called Ancient Incident. And there were two chairs with, uh, that are on steps leading up to two chairs and the chairs are actually facing each other. And uh, how this came about was through a conversation of, of some things and, and, and um, uh, 
but that someone from Birmingham and of course the history of things have gone back in there and they wanted to, to have some art. And I don't know, Bob th just thought those chairs look like two, two chairs, the sculpture is beautiful, but together like forced to, to have two people have a conversation perhaps. And, and when we talked about that and put that because that was the original was in, in all wood and it took several years uh, to, make we had to couldn't even deconstruct it to do that we had to make a replica in wood weather it ourselves do everything at Lawrence Voitech once again and the founder we used it pretty instrumental to do that and they look so real and um and and a part of it's I, I believe it's going to be a possibility right now I'm not 100% sure but I think part of the a national gallery but that's for others to know. I just kind of heard a rumor. So, but it's it, it it's socially. I think that was the two chairs and conversations. That it, and I think that speaks to a lot of the themes that you were mentioning with Rocky, which stands for the Rauschenberg yes. Overseas Cultural Interchange. For those who don't know, yes, thank you. Uh, yes. Kind of, so, um, but I think that same idea of conversation and dialogue shows up in that the energy that's put behind that project. Yes. From, Yes, uh, Linda. So I'm, I'm interested in the personal artistic um, voyage with Keats. Did Keats, was he the kind of artist that knew a piece was finished when it was, how, how did he know that it was finished? In the ether. Uh, Linda's question was about his, his vision and his process. Uh, how did Rauschenberg know when a piece was done, when it was complete? That's a great question because it, the two hardest things were where to start and knowing when to finish. And, and, and that is a problem for that almost everyone has. But he had an uncanny uh, way of that when he decided it was finished, he, once he signed it, it was finished and he did go back and, and, and it was so tempting. I'm sure for most artists, it's so tempting to do that, but um, it had done its, it served its purpose. He used to always joke and say, and he, they look at somebody else and, and if they were doing too much or something, he's like, you do not have to use every cornflake in the box. It, enough's enough, but you, it, you know, but you have to be true to your heart and you have to know when, when it's, it, you know, it's, it, it's, take it on its own life and uh, it's it's time to stop because then you, you you've you've killed it you've killed the life if you go too far it it's tricky some some understand some don't it's subjective I think there was another question up there yeah <laughs> the, qu the question is what was Rauschenberg's favorite medium well you know he he Loved to paint, uh, but he just loved to play, and and he would play with so many things. It, it just uh, in in the years that I was there, we were doing more in the in the medium of, of using the photo photography and doing photo transfers. But you could tell when 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 the sculpture things, he loved to watch that and do that and uh, get his hands dirty. And I. I don't think he had a favorite. He, he was kind of like me picking a favorite of his. He he didn't want to limit. They were all everything brought a purpose and and, and was special in its own way to him, including performance art that we didn't even go touch. Yes, yeah. just hours. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions from the room? Out in the world. Other questions from out in the world. <laughs> If not, we can turn it back to Florence for another question. <laughs> so Kevin, is there any question that I neglected to ask you? Well, there's so many, but I, I, I think, you know what, I'd like people to, you know, leave with this about as much as anything. If, even if you don't really, you know, you might see some restaurants you like, or if you, you don't like his work, I think, uh, what you'll find very interesting is his process and also, you know, just the, the thought of art. If you're interested in art, 
just it, it, there's fascinating. We could go for days talking about, but curiosity and for everybody to have curiosity and keep their minds open and, and, and to, it's, it's interesting that you talk about curiosity uh, because I always say to people, um, take a second right now and close your eyes and think about a situation when you were curious. Okay, and now open your eyes. When you're in that place of thinking about of curiosity, you're at a place where you're you're not, you know, you're not frowning, you're not negative, you're not judging. There's a sort of youthful bliss, childlike innocence. And that curiosity is what fascinates me about Bob and fascinates me about his work. And my mother, who's here tonight, thank you. She, you know, she always says, Why do you like contemporary art? And, and, you know, and I always say, because I love the, this idea of line, like what it does with lines and space and color and, and also because I have that curiosity. Well, you know, and that is what, that's what we need right now. We, 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 everything has become so polarized and, and the, you know, and this is just leave a place for curiosity of what, why are they thinking that way? Well, you know, I, I, uh, Bob was literally curious all the way to the end. Um, I was with with him with others, his captiva family and his sister, the, the, uh, up until the very end. And um, he was ready uh, because he, you know, I don't want to go into too much detail because uh, he didn't want it to be, if, if living was going to be hooked and never doing all these machines. And he said, I'm, I'm ready and I'm at peace at it. Uh, my uh, my brother actually had knocked on the door and said, "Bob, we he got out of the hospital. And we in his studio. He had it set. He said, I got to get be in my studio.' And literally was set up like a hospital. And um, he wanted to be there at that studio. And he was because he was ready to go back to work. But then the realization came, Bob, this is it. And so I get a, my brother come over. Came over and knocked on my door and said, "Bob's leaving today." And I said. Where the hell is he going? Because it just, I'm like, where he got, because I was like, does he want to go going to, back to the hospital? He said, no, he, he says he's leaving today. And uh, Bob, in typical fashion, by the end of that day, Bob, Bob left us. But in the very end, I mean, Bob's mind was brilliant and sharp and everything else. And unfortunately, his body had, had uh, was not keeping up. But uh, he, I said, you know, I wonder what's next. And and mm. he was he was resolute with that. He did, he really did wonder what's next. And in Bob's typical fashion of taking keep taking care of everybody, as he kind of paused for a second, he looked up, he said, I find out I'll get back with you. <laughs> and you know what? If anybody could do it, that guy, we call him our shaman because he's part of Cherokee heritage. And we always said, if ever on the side of 50 50 he always was on the best side and because he went in with with you know not nothing negative he went always in and went forward and uh exactly yeah wide, nothing wide eyed and bushy tailed even at the end wherever he's at, where he's at right now uh, he's he's looking for things to do and uh i truly believe that i, I don't know you know, it doesn't matter, but he's, he's somewhere doing something. I know that. <laughs> and he's, he's smiling. And, and I think that Absolutely. message of, of, you know, can we take a pause from some of the negativity? Can we bring back a little bit of, of this joy and this creativity? Just, and, and, you know, that is, that is what art can do. And, yeah. and I hope that everybody Joy that goes through the exhibit remembers that when they walk through. And it's also the Lotus series. And it's been done very tranquil. So it's also a respite from the craziness that somebody can walk in into the museum and just have a peaceful moment of, of it looks beautiful, great space. So thank you everyone tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful place to, to end with that, that poignant memory because clearly Rauschenberg's spirit lives on both in the exhibition and in amongst us. I, I feel like I encounter so many artists, young or old, who always say, oh my gosh, Rauschenberg influenced me in so many ways. And I think that's because of the multifaceted career he had, which you described 
a true honor and pleasure to have you both here to share this. Thank you for bringing the exhibition to Morgantown. It's an extremely special opportunity. If you haven't seen the exhibition through December 12th, open Thursday through Sunday, 12.30 to 6 p.m. And if you're super far away and can't get to Morgantown, as Florence mentioned, there is a 3D uh, walkthrough of the exhibition available on our website. So with that, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you.